when you're talking about the motives of a government? Speaker. Ah. <laughs> 49. I call Maria Lube. Tēnā koe, Madam Speaker. It is with immense privilege that I stand here to take a call on the Employment Relations Amendment Bill. Um, in 2011... Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. Point of order. Speaker, I do apologise to the member for introduce, uh, interrupting as she's getting underway, but can we just can clarify... Sit down? Can we just have one standing... Up? Could we just clarify that this is a split call? I beg your pardon. Yeah. It is a split call. Thank it's you. a... Yeah. Five-minute call with a ballot one, Thank and you. us, and a Thank national you. call for the second five minutes. Uh, in 2011, I was halfway through my employment law papers, and at the same time, the, um, the then national government uh, introduced some changes to the Employment Relations Act. And I remember at the time thinking they were a real attack on working people. And also, as a second-year law student. Um, I felt that they were completely disregarding the object of that act, which actually states that um, you should recognise um, and also address the imbalance in the employment uh, relationship, the power of it. So I, I never would have thought that six years later I'm standing here talking about a bill that is going to make such a huge difference in the lives of working people, and not just working people, their families, their communities, their representatives indeed, and their employers as well. Now, I know there's been a lot of scaremongering going on how these changes are going to take us back to the 70s, but actually these changes are a sign of us being a very modern government because they will give us an opportunity to improve, modernise and innovate the workplace. And in fact, the good employers won't even notice any difference because they are already doing all these things. They will actually find that these changes will benefit them because what it will do is it will make it much harder for bad employers to go into unfair competition. But the bad employers, the ones who have boosted their incomes and profits by raiding the pay package of their workforce, they are the ones who are going to feel the impact of these changes. So this bill is the first step in righting a lot of these wrongs. This bill is about restoring some basic human rights of workers, the right to be treated fairly and with dignity, the right to feel respected and to be valued. Now, the previous member had asked us about an example of the rest and meal break, saying that it was all made up. So I've, I've got a little example here, which is factual. You can check it. Um, as soon as the changes became law of the um, rest and meal breaks, instead of having two paid breaks in the morning and in the afternoon and an unpaid break in the middle of the day, production run times were increased. So there would only be one break, one paid and one unpaid. This means longer hour on the production chain, standing on concrete, in gumboots, doing repetitive and strenuous movements. These people I'm talking about work either in freezing temperatures in the chillers or in extreme heat in the slaughter and boning rooms. They have their arms and hands above their heads for hours on end. And there's heavy lifting that takes its toll on longer runs. Toilet and water breaks are actively discouraged because it means stopping the chain. Now, the outcome for these workers is fatigue and more injuries. And it gets worse as the day wears on because with overuse on backs, shoulders, wrists, and, and the fatigue, there's also an increased risk of knife wounds. This is an example of the meat industry, and the FCO teleworkers are looking forward to rest and meal breaks being restored as soon as possible. Now, plenty more where this came from. A comment was also made the other day um, about it was all being about jobs, and the first priority is just about having a job. How uninspiring, having a job, never mind what the pay of conditions are, don't worry about job security, minimum standards, health and safety, working people should just be grateful they have a job. Well, some of them have more than a job, they have two or three, and that's because one job doesn't pay the bills. They are not choosing to take more than one job, they are doing it because they need to survive. Now, there's an Ed2 member, she's a cleaner. She works three shifts between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. Her husband does the 
uh, mid-afternoon and evening shifts, and he's the security guard. They're both on minimum wages. They work their butts off, and they still can't afford to pay for their family of two children. They can't even spend time with their family. So when you're talking about it's all about this job creation and how wonderful we have all these jobs, these are the people you're hurting. They're hardworking Kiwis, people that can't get ahead. We have people that put their heart and soul into jobs, looking after our most vulnerable in, the, in healthcare, in, in disability, and still after 19, 20 years in their jobs, they're still on $17 an hour. Now, this is what this bill is addressing. Yes, um, our working people are not commodities. They are, first of all, people. They have human rights. They have lives outside work. This bill is a good start to changing that, and I commend this bill to the House. Speaker. I call the Honourable Tim McEnroe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I invite